Welcome to episode two of the Bee Educated Show, sponsored by Bee Pods, your resource for everything bees, pollinators, and innovative education. Whether you're a teacher, a backyard beekeeper, or somewhere in between, we can help you out with information and quality support. So today is a very special episode because I have with me my co-host for this show for the foreseeable future and hopefully forever. Uh, her name is Hannah, and I don't want to tell too much of her story, but I do want to introduce the fact that Hannah is a beekeeper with us. That's how she came to us. She signed up for a beekeeping training program where she then was supporting customers and clients and supporting our own apiaries. But before that, she has a very interesting story that she's going to share with us today. So with that being said, how are you doing today, Hannah? Great. How are you, Ben? I'm great. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone else, too. I'm super, I'm super excited to have you on the show this year because I think everything that we talk about this year is going to be very, very uh, important. And your perspective, and this is a teaser, Hannah's perspective on this whole season coming up that we're going to tell you in the next episode will be extremely important to all of those who are listening, specifically those educators looking for some innovative ways to engage their students. So with that, Hannah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to us? Sure. Yeah. No, I'm really excited to get started with this podcast because I think it'll be really interesting to get insight on a variety of people that I've met and um, people that we'll reach out to during this season. But prior to working with Bee Pods, I was a Peace Corps volunteer and I was in the environment sector um, for a year before the pandemic. That's awesome. So tell us, for those of us who don't understand what the Peace Corps is, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what that means overall and then how that fit into what you were doing. Because I'm sure there's, there's, there's thousands of Peace Corps volunteers out there, right? Yeah, there definitely are. Um, and everybody's so, role is a little different. Yes, yes. Um, we start as a volunteer and we are um, either assigned or applied to specific locations throughout the world. Um, and these communities in these different countries request Peace Corps volunteers specifically to work on specific projects. And it depends on which country it is and what kind of work they want to have done. But we have a bunch of different sectors. Mine was environmental, but there's also agriculture, there's health, and there's education. So it really depends on um, what the communities want from Peace Corps volunteers and what type of work that they would like to have in their communities. But it's a wide array of, of locations throughout the world, as well as who we'll be working with on the ground there and the types of projects that we end up doing. So your role was more environmental. So what, what did that mean? What, what was something you did while you were out in the world, helping the world, making it a better place? Yeah, so my assignment was to Peace Corps Paraguay. And there we were specifically working to help three aspects of the environment. They wanted us to focus on environmental education um, and trash management, as well as tree planting. There is a lot of deforestation in the region, but as Peace Corps volunteers, our mission was more centered around um, engagement and awareness towards these activities and doing small local projects as far as tree planting. That's so awesome. my work what? specifically was working with schools. Um, I was paired with a environmental high school and worked with two environmental, um, there were more grade school, like elementary schools in the community that I was with. What made you want to go into the Peace Corps? What, what made you say, hey, uh, this is something I want to do and I'm going to dive all in. I'm going to go to probably a country I would imagine you had never been to. And no. at that point, you decided to literally just dive in head first, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. so what, what, what was the driving force behind that? Well, I originally heard about Peace Corps back in high school. I um, have a family relative that I personally was never introduced to. She died long before I was born but she was a Peace Corps volunteer in Malawi 
Um, and I had an incredible experience while I was in college that kind of connected me more towards the idea of entering the Peace Corps world, where a group of um, five of us in a cohort with some graduate students and specifically led by a professor there took us to Tanzania and we were doing some social ecological research and really engaging with the Maasai community, which is an indigenous group in Tanzania. Um, and so I heard about more about what it might mean to be a Peace Corps volunteer and saw that as a great bridge for me to be working in the, um, environmental education and working on a bunch, a variety of environmental projects while getting some hands-on um, cultural exposure. And uh, it's really an interesting opportunity to exchange information between cultures. So that was re really what got me interested in, in, in the first place. Um, and it was something that I was looking into after graduating and um, it just kind of came about like that. That's nuts. I, I think it's, it's interesting and, and amazing to hear how all those little details of your story tied you and pulled you in that direction, right? Like right, that yeah. interaction of that trip and that experience where like now you had something that was driving you and something where you're like, hey, I can actually help. And you took and you actually did something with it. That's awesome. So thanks for doing that. But tell mm -hmm. me, tell me what, what was the biggest challenge with that? Like in your mind, you had to be going through like questions of like, hey, what is this really what I should be doing? Right. With all everybody saying, maybe I should go do something else. How, how did you get through all of that? What, what was that thought process like? What were the challenges? Well, I think that one of the biggest things that I was excited about was just meeting people and having those new experiences. And I think that the people that I met and talked to about Peace Square experience, I, ahead of time were a huge bridge for me to decide that it was something that I could see myself doing. Um, speaking to um, both people that have gone through the Peace Corps experience and professors that were recommending it as an experience to give you a better idea of what the real, real world is like in, as, in terms of um, community engagement in different countries. But yeah, I mean, there there definitely are a lot of challenges when you're deciding to uproot yourself and go to a different place that you've never been to, where you really don't have much of an idea what the culture is like and all the challenges that you might face. But I think that in the end, like it definitely helped expand my personal views and give a better, bro broader expansion of the information that is necessary to make a bigger difference. What was, I mean, I'm sure you learned a gazillion things on that trip, right? But uh, <laughs> what was like, if you had to, to boil it down to like your top three takeaways, what, what were maybe those top three takeaways in, in any order? Top three, no, that's, yeah, that's definitely really hard. Um, so That's I think my here. experience was a little <laughs> unique too with our group because we were only there for a couple months before we had to be evacuated with the COVID pandemic. Um, so, and it was interesting too because for the seven months that we were in sight um, on the ground there, we had like a large amount of it was in the summer months. So it was really hot and like culturally and um, because of the climate, people aren't working as much. So everyone's kind of locked down already um, and just taking it slow, spending time with people and just getting to know them was like one of the biggest things that I really wasn't expecting to just to be talking for you know, hours and hours and never talk about like specific projects and t types of things that we might be working on together. It was really all about building connections and starting from the ground up that way. So I think maybe one of those three things for me would be how important it is to take things slow and to not just be um, driven by 
the goal of trying to, you know, plant those 10 trees or work with a specific group of kids on a specific event, that it's really important first to slow down and really get to know the people that you're working with. Um, yeah, I don't know. That might have been too lengthy of an answer to add another two. But <laughs> that's okay. No, I think I think that's awesome. Um, so just so I'm understanding, you you learned like we we here in in the U.S. we we like Zoom and and I am like Zoom all over, right? Today mm -hmm. today is a prime example, right? For for those of you who don't know, this morning I was at the warehouse doing customer service calls. Drove back. Hannah was waiting patiently for me and was going, hey, all right, I'm ready. Whenever Brad gets here, we're going to do this thing. And, and it, goes, it goes to show you that, that uh, around the rest of the world, based on what Hannah shared with me, as well as what some other people, is that they do take, they, time is treated differently. That's, that's probably the best way I can phrase it, right? Because there are other places that people are zooming around just like we are, but then there are other places that are also, it's relaxed right? Things mm -hmm. happen when they happen. And it happens right. that way for a reason, right? And, and I think that that alone is such a, a valuable piece of perspective, um, especially for me. So Hannah probably will remind me of that every once in a while. So it's good for me. Um, at the same point in time, like, the cool thing is that bees are very similar that way too, right? Bees do things on their own time. I'm sure you've seen that where all of a sudden bees at one point are like hurrying, bringing back food a lot. And then all of a sudden there's a week where maybe they're just building comb inside and there are, isn't as much foraging going on. Have you, have you ever witnessed that? Yes, I have. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, this goes back to one of the reasons why we're doing this show, right? Bees are, are a physical manifestation of things that we can learn from because they are a living organism where they all have to work together in order to succeed. And what Hannah just illustrated is exactly an example of what we do as human beings in different cultures and how those bees can represent that same idea. So one of the things that we are going to work on really hard, Hannah and I are going to get really good at metaphors and analogies. And you'll probably hear us say it's kind of like, or it's kind of like this one thing over here in order to help you understand and picture what we're talking about when we're talking about maybe bees or beekeeping, but also when we're talking about letting bees be the teacher or letting bees be the demonstration for what you're trying to engage your students or others with, mm -hmm. just as a point. So thanks for bringing that story up. I think that's a, that's a great segue. So I know there's probably a couple other reasons or lessons you so learned. What is, is there another <laughs> lesson? So share, share another one. I, this is like gold here. Sure. Well, I mean, just spinning off of what you were saying about bees, um, I guess another good segue is just how important it is to be flexible with people and working on those different projects. Um, having a spe specific idea of how you want things to turn out isn't necessarily how things are going to go, but you can either beat yourself up about it or you can just roll with the punches and try to um, make it so it's better than how you thought it was going to be. Um, really working with people and trying to figure out the best way to approach these different issues. Um, just really being open-minded about everyone else's perspectives and ideas is really essential to making the largest impact in everyone else's lives. What, what about that trip helped you to, to look at, like, achievement or goal achievement or um, project execution in that way? What specifically? Was there something that happened in that trip that really like helped that to click into gear? Because I think that's also really cool. Yeah. Um, I don't want to point anyone out, but I did work with some people who were very much like um, not oriented in kind of the way that we are here in the U.S., you know, as far as trying to work through projects and having specific ideas about how things should be done. Um, it might have just been like a spur of the moment, like, mm, I don't, I think we should change that, you know, like five minutes before you're about to host an event or like 
some big project that's about to happen and they're like, no, I think this should be a different way. It's like, okay, let's take it back, slow down a minute and think this through. But also like those spur of the moment things are valuable thing, assets and insights into different um, ways that you can approach whatever project or um, education activity that you are about to embark on. That's awesome. So that reminds me of, uh, I was just in a hive this last weekend. Um, and, and you go in with a plan, right? You, you yeah. always go in with a plan. And then the bees decide that your plan doesn't mean anything and they decide to shift it. And so I actually had to walk away because I just got really frustrated because there was no way I was going to get through this inspection and look at all the bars to ensure that I was really looking to see where honey stores were at because we're trying to determine if, if there needs to be supplemental um, like if we need to bring in pollination plant or plants and flowers and, and we're looking for the long term in terms of the apiary because I want to make sure that there's enough food end to end um, mm -hmm. and the only way you can really do that is to dive in and look at the honey but the bees must have been robbed by something or so all of a sudden they got really defensive right away and and so it was one of those things where it's it's like your friend who like at the beginning you go in with a plan we're going to do this and they go nope we're not going to do it that way and you're just like <sighs> the deep breath and and you try and go with the flow right right that's no really intended. the only way that you can do it right yeah and to force it All just right. makes it, things worse that's right yeah i <laughs> i i tend to sometimes be the person who's like i'm just going to muscle through this thing and do it and then it ends up being just a bigger mess sometimes i yeah. I can be accused of that sometimes. Yeah, I think we all can. that the hard way too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, is there anything, any, any other big takeaway that you're like, I got to share this one after we're talking through it, that you're just like, this one really, now that I've talked through all these, uh, these other two, I really want to share this one. Sure. Um, I think that another important insight that really any educator can probably experience on their own two feet uh, would probably just be knowing your audience. I had a classroom that I was teaching in and on the very first day I was thrown into a mix of maybe like 20 kids who I didn't know at the time but spoke a different language than the language that I was teaching in. Um, and so they didn't understand what the lesson was about and what we were doing and I, I mean, I was clueless to it during the whole thing because no one had told me ahead of time that's what they spoke. And I was um, originally prepped to be taught, be teaching in Spanish instead of the local language, Granny. And so, um, I mean, these kids were too nervous to like speak up and say anything, but there was just so many like glassy eyes, like no one's participating. Uh, it was a really challenging lesson to get through because I was like, well, these kids aren't getting anything out of it. But I mean, in the end, I try to always integrate like some kind of game or active activity, just especially for the younger kids that just really need to run around when they've been stuck in a classroom all day. So yeah, even explaining those games was really hard. But as long as you try to use um, body movements and kind of get people engaged, uh, yeah, it was really an interesting experience to try to figure out how to best connect with this group of kids. But I think that a big takeaway from that experience for me was just really knowing um, your audience. And even if you're caught in, in a situation like that, where you really aren't able to connect with them the way that you want to, that there's still something that they're able to take away from the experience. And hopefully you are too. That's crazy to me. Like, first of all, props just in general, because I think <laughs> I'm picturing me. I'm like, as you were telling that story, I'm picturing me in front of a group of kids. Little, I would imagine they were mostly kids, right? Uh, yeah. 12, 13 and under. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm talking and they're probably, they're probably like trying to be engaged to try and show respect, I would imagine. 
Yeah, and, yeah. and they didn't want to talk and you're back talking. and you know yeah, yeah. and you and you think you're doing a great job they're listening to you and all of a sudden you get to the end of the lesson did, did you ask a question and like when did you realize in that lesson that all of a sudden <laughs> you're like holy cow i totally taught them a whole lesson in a foreign language like what <laughs> I, I, well, I'm I mean, trying to picture your face, like when that happens. Like, what does that feel like? What does that, what does that look like? How <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't just like one moment where I was like, well, this isn't going according to plan. Because I try to, I think it's so important when you're teaching these lessons to make them as engaging and hands-on as possible, even if you are in this classroom setting. So I would have a kid come up to the whiteboard and draw something and try to like get them engaged that way and um you know like ask questions and sometimes people like the kids would raise their hands normally and that type of thing to answer questions um like we got up in a circle and actually i was co-teaching this lesson so i was co-teaching with another peace corps volunteer and the two of us um had all the kids circle up and we we're doing like a different chain of the food web and throwing like the ball of yarn across the circle to the next kid to catch to like kind of demonstrate how the food chain works in the food web. And, you know, like the kids are just throwing the yarn and <laughs> it's not like the connections aren't there and they were participating, but they didn't really know how to. Um, so it, w it really wasn't until the very end that we figured out um, that they weren't understanding what we were saying for the majority of the lesson that's that's uh that's incredible um <laughs> like all right so so for those of you listening uh we we <laughs> hannah hannah did share this with me a little bit prior to this discussion so she actually wants to share this this how she managed that when you're trying to teach students in a different language and how you deal with multilingual classrooms Mm -hmm. uh, at some point down the road. So if you listen and you continue to listen to us, there will be an episode where I'm sure Hannah will tell you in detail how that whole day probably went, I would imagine. <laughs> and hopefully we'll have some more insight into that from our guests on the show as well. Look at that, dropping all the teasers. Here, here we come. So, <laughs> yeah. all right. So, so you got a glimpse into Hannah's story, where she's been, how she got there, what, what brought her back. Hey, I know COVID has been a pain for all of us right now because we're recording this, but my silver lining for COVID is that if we didn't have that, Hannah probably wouldn't be here. She'd still be down in the jungle, teaching kids, making an impact. So instead, guess what? We get to share her experiences and she gets to share her experiences with us. So. There's silver lining for all of you who are like, this is an awful year. I'll give you a positive right there. All right, sound good? How do you like that one, Hannah? I do like it. And I think it's important for everyone to know that wherever you are, you can make an impact. Yeah, totally. And that's, and that's why we're here. So with that, I wanna, I wanna ask you maybe two other questions about now that you've been through that experience, you came across Bee Pods, you joined our beekeeping team, what is something right now that, that either you're working on on the side or you're working on outside of this project, right? Just so everybody knows, we are, we are taking this, this Be Educated podcast and we're shaping it as we go because we determined based on feedback from the BPOD's clients and customers and other people we work with in education that this was something that there aren't a lot of people talking about and sharing information in this medium. And so I, I wanted to pick pick Hannah's brain to see if there's anything else that she's working on right now outside of this. So is there? Sure, yeah. So as far as things that I'm involved with right now, I've got a volunteer opportunity that I've been doing off and on. And this is something that, um, you know, I've kind of started just a couple weeks ago because of COVID restrictions, but the place that I'm volunteering at is really great with you know, security and health preventions. So I've been working with an urban farm in my community and a lot of the proceeds to, of the um, produce that they 
grow there actually goes to a bunch of different food pantries within the community. So I think it's been really nice to just get out there and keep my hands dirty and, um, you know, make sure that still making some kind of difference within the community because, you know, everyone's struggling pretty hard right now. And then on top of that, I'm still kind of in the unemployed spectrum. So I'm searching for unemployment or employment opportunities in the environmental education realm. Um, in the future, probably we'll be looking into graduate school and hopefully at some point, no, I will at some point be going back to Paraguay and seeing all the people that I wasn't able to say goodbye to and just spending more time with all the people that um, really made an impact on me while I was there. So those are my biggest things for the time being. Um, I'm also going backpacking and camping on the weekends when I have the opportunity and the privilege to do so. Um, going out and gardening and, you know, just talking to neighbors from a safe distance and that kind of thing. I like it. I like it. Lots of things going on. Um, part of, part like of what, busy. what our goal is. <laughs> That's right. I, as as my, uh, my mom and my grandma used to say, they used to tell me, hey, we keep you busy because we're worried that if we didn't keep you busy, you'd get in trouble. So I totally understand yep. staying busy all the time. <laughs> Idle hands, right? Idle hands. Right. Um, cool. So with that, let, let me ask you a few. Uh, we're we're going to do something almost every episode with our guests where we're going to fire off some questions. So you ready? Yes, let's go. All righty. All right. Um, what is the best advice you've ever received? Well, I will tell you that one of the best advices that I've received is how important it is to stay open-minded um, about diverse perspectives. Um, and even if you have very strong opinions that go against them, to really be open to listening to what others have to say and trying to have, you know, constructive conversations about serious issues that are really important to you. Awesome, I think that's especially important right now. So that's great advice. Um, all right, next question. What is a, a book you're reading right now? Oh, I have been reading off and on Braiding Sweetgrass, which is an incredible book. I really recommend it. It's, um, a lot about environmentalism, but from an indigenous perspective. And the author is great. She is actually a professor out in Maine, I want to say, but she's um, has roots with the Potawatomi tribe, if I'm not mistaken. And she has a lot of um, different perspectives that kind of wrap into what it means to be living in the United States today and all of the environmental issues that are coming up and how we can make a difference in our own communities. So it's really awesome. like that the way that it's written is beautiful too. Sounds like a really good book. We're going to find that. We'll drop that in the show notes for people too. So people can find it. Cause that, That's a great that sounds actually like a really cool book. Um, yeah. And my last question for today is what's your favorite D pun? Favorite what? Your favorite bee pun. Bee pun. Oh, I feel like that might be a spoiler to our future episodes. <laughs> oh, give it, give us a taste. Let's, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Give me a taste, huh? Um, let's see. I don't know if I can just pull one out of my hat like that. <laughs> Be What's your favorite? Come on. What's yours, Brad? <laughs> um, my favorite bee pun as of late, because I've been doing this for a long time, right? So anytime anybody hears that Brad's the bee guy or Brad plays with bees, what do you think is the first thing they do? They send me pictures of bees. They send me articles of bees. And so what I try to do is I just try to be chill and nod and smile. Like every time I get one of those, because I'm trying to listen all the time and just be chill and don't throw it back. Cause I know they're trying to help, even though most of these I've seen almost constantly, right? Like, Hey, did you see this article? And I go, 
mm-hmm, thanks for the article. That's a good article. You know, just be chill, be keeping it cool, right? Be keeping it cool. And if you, if you be keeping it cool, everybody else will be keeping it cool too. <laughs> I just dropped like 10 of them in that commentary. If you didn't pick up on them, you've got a lot of listening to this show to do because we're going to be throwing B puns left and right just because that's some of the fun, I think. I love it. I need to start <laughs> practicing. <laughs> you got to up your game here, Hannah. If, you're, yeah. if we're going to do this, to we're going to do this every week. You better come with a laundry list, right? Like, I which should. one today? Which one today am I going to use? <laughs> All right. Yep. We'll get ready for next time. All right. We might. Hey, we might even drop a list of those. If here, here, we're going to do something fun. I think this is spontaneous on air. You've heard it here first. If somebody keeps track of them and after season one can send us a list of every single one that we have done in an episode, you're going to get a special prize. Oh. I promise you that. <laughs> Cause guess what? We, we keep show notes. We keep recordings. We've got this stuff on lockdown. We've got Brian Omig, our producer here. He's going to be keeping track of this stuff for me. And I can tell you this, we've got some awesome swag coming down the pipeline. We've also got some really cool decals, right? Um, that's why the be keeping it cool is a pretty good, cool decal. If, if you're interested in that stuff, you can find all of it on the website, uh, beeducatedshow.com. But to the lucky person who after our last episode of season one, and you'll know it, but you got to listen to it. Whoever can send us the list first is going to get a really cool prize. All right. What do you think about that, Hannah? That sounds amazing. I wonder if yeah, I can I, get I, into this pot too. Legally, you can't. You know, <laughs> this is the way radio works. You're not yeah. allowed to participate in the stuff based on All the right. rules. All right. Well, I'll bribe someone else I to know. do it or something. There, there you go. Now you're thinking. <laughs> All right. So with that, hey, this is episode two of the Be Educated show. Um, I had a wonderful time. Some of those stories Hannah hasn't shared with me before, so every episode you're going to see how hannah and i get to know each other even better and hannah's actually got a couple guests already lined up for a few episodes coming down the line but in next episode we're actually going to tell you what the lineup's going to be for us all right we're going to go through season one and the reason we chose to do it this way is because um we work with a lot of different people and we wanted to make each of these seasons have a primary a group of people that we're going to be working with. And I'm not going to drop too many hints. You heard some in this episode, but we work with, with educators, business owners, backyard beekeepers, golf course superintendents, um, restaurateurs, entrepreneurs, uh, property managers, landscape companies, you name it. We've worked with them and we've built custom solutions around beekeeping and pollination and environmental education for whatever their needs are. And so I want to be sure that if you're listening to this, every single show that we do that's part of this core season, you'll get some value out of it. So if you're not one of those core groups of people, I promise you, we're going to be sprinkling in some other episodes in between focused on beekeeping techniques, focused on different stories from some of our customers and clients that we're going to be pulling in. This is going to be a lot of fun. And I can't thank you all enough for listening, for coming along and for coming along on this journey, because guess what? We're going to, we're going to ask for feedback and it's going to be reliant on those of you listening as to maybe some of what the, some of what we talk about. Uh, we've got some great authors that we've got lined up that, that I've been working with. We've got some beekeepers who've been doing beekeeping for, I'm talking 40, 50 years that we're going to have on here. We've got some family businesses that we're going to pull in here. Um, at some point, I imagine we're going to be able to get some of our other vendors in here, some really cool people that maybe you've heard of that we're going to introduce you to part of this is introducing you to the team. That's why Hannah's on here. At some point, we're going to get some of our other beekeepers on here and our other team at bee pods, because we think it's important that you understand that bee pods, we are all driven by the fact that we still believe in the fact that we can make a positive impact on the world. Enough of this world ending stuff, right? Like enough. It takes micro actions every week and every day by everybody in the world. And you'd be surprised how fast that that story will shift in the media. They don't talk about the positive things happening. We're going to bring the positive here. So 
So if you want to hear positive stuff happening in the world, that's what we're doing here. Sounds great to me. We got two thumbs up from Hannah. All right. So until next time, go check us out at BeEducatedShow.com. If you like this episode, please, please, please take a screen capture of it, share it with your friends, tag us in it. We'll be sure to share you on not only the, the podcast page, but also some of our other pages across all of the interwebs um, and all of that good stuff. So we look forward. We need your support because we want to be sure that we get this information out to the people who want to hear it and need it. Um, and that even means if they think they don't need it, guess what? They might at least find it interesting and share it with somebody else. So thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode. Take care. Mm -hmm.